on where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great event on tap. I am just so excited about this webinar because I love this topic. But before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded. So if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for our speaker, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your question and answer tab and submit your questions. And we'll try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. We also have a very interactive chat web uh, interface on our, our section on the interface. So you can go ahead and chat us up uh, with your questions, comments, suggestions, whatever you want to send over our way. We'll be more than happy to uh, chat you back. And then finally, at the end of today's webinar, we are going to be doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. Uh, so please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our four lucky winners. All right, with that, let's go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is chaos engineering. Introduction to chaos engineering fundamentals. Our speaker today is Lindison Webb, who is the Chaos Account Manager at Gremlin. Uh, Lindison, thank you so much for joining me today. So great to see you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to take myself off camera and put myself on mute. Let's get right into your presentation, and I'll see you during the question and answer period. Outstanding. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, DevOps uh, community. Uh, my name is Linda Webb, and as introduced, I am the Chaos Account Manager. So, generally, we like to start this conversation with uh, issues that we have experienced within the community. Now, I get I got to live through this 2017 AWS three outage. I'm sure many of you here as well uh, were impacted by this. I remember this day very, very, very deeply in that I was unable to deploy any of my Terraform deployments. Everything was stuck. Uh, the S3 state bucket was down. And we kept going out to Amazon, right? We were like, it can't be our stuff. And we remember seeing the services operating normally, right? So this has always been something that's been close to me, right? Um, it, it impacted lots of people. Uh, engineering, <coughs> uh, the issue for this engineering basically intended to do a restart and recycle some stuff on the billing systems for S3. And it did not work as planned, right? Uh, impacted organizations that we saw across the board were with Docker Hub, uh, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, Travis CI, Slack, PagerDuty. And as I mentioned before, that little services operating normally sort of just stayed there. And everybody who kept going back, it became a meme. It started to trend on Twitter, right? Awesome day at AWS land, et cetera. Um, other outages, right, that we've seen across the industry. Uh, there's a huge outage when I was at my previous employee, uh, largest uh, ticketing company on the planet. We ended up in a position where we were unable to send emails, right? So I, I don't even think we were able to send emails for 12 plus hours, right? The first outage occurred on the 24th of January. A secondary outage occurred on 29th of January. Millions of folks across the globe were unable to utilize, uh, Office 365, <clears throat> customers couldn't receive or send emails, and then some businesses uh, closed up for the whole day, right? I remember we're unable to do our contracts and emails. It was uh, quite disruptive to us, <laughs> um, right? Google wrote the SRE book. So this is this, an uh, organization which talks about uptime, talks about resiliency, talks about reliability, yet even Google suffered an outage, right? And this outage... <clears throat> impacted all these Google Cloud services. So imagine it being winter time, your Nest thermostats are unable to do what they are able to do because you have no connectivity to the Google Cloud. Uh, iCloud was affected, right? So Apple took a huge uh, hit on this as well. Millions of users were impacted. Customers couldn't receive or send email. I remember this day just as well as the, uh, the S3 outage, right? Unable to send my emails. YouTube was down. Oh, excuse me. So basically, what does that all mean, right? As we get to huge inherent complexity that we continue to build out within the cloud, right? 
So if, if you go through here, you think about picking any date, doesn't matter what it is, you do it right now, you just type outage, right? It will output some outage that has occurred across somewhere that's impacted. I think there's a, a download time or downtime.org, et cetera, that you can go to and see what's out. Failures are inherent to complex systems, right? So as we continue to move away from our comfort zones, right, these monoliths in the past, et cetera, as we go forward, <coughs> we start increasing our downtime because we have to change the way we build our systems, right? So what, what do we mean when we say complex systems? So in the complex systems, if you think about Amazon, Netflix, Azure, Google, et cetera, we move from the on-prem system to the cloud. Uh, we decrease our costs, right? We have all these arguments for why we should go there. Decrease costs, increase agility, low maintenance, better ability to scale, on-demand infrastructure, use as much as you need, decom what you don't need. Uh, the bad side is we give up control, right? We sacrifice that control that we had within our own on-prem data centers. And the results that come from this is we have to look at how we build software. Look at how we build our software and look at better ways to build our applications. So we move from the monoliths to microservices. We uh, A good thing to come from that to microservices ideas, we can increase developer velocity. We have better ability to scale. We have, uh, we have a better ability to scale. <coughs> Excuse me, just one second. All right, so so as a demonstration of chaos engineering, my uh, the little boss has just woke up and she's uh, determined that we have to talk. Uh, so we have a better ability to scale. And what does this mean when we start moving to microservices? At first, we move a monolith. We have 10 systems that we're running out there. So it's a little area on this, this little orange area on the Netflix diagram. Then we've got hundreds of systems and then thousands of systems. My experience over at CERN is we had 51,000 microservices running. So that's a lot. Uh, another bad thing to come out of this is we have larger, more distributed systems, larger, more complex systems. And the results is we have to look at new ways to create and test our software. We have to look at new ways to handle failures. So these two uh, diagrams or pictures here are basically what we like to refer to as the death balls. And these are taken in 2015. So imagine what they look like today in 2021. Here we go. <clears throat> so downtime costs money, right? This is this is no uh, debate that we have here, right? When down when we suffer downtime within the industry, we're losing revenue. We're losing possible revenue. Uh, employee productivity goes down. We have the possibility of uh, quantifiable knowns, right? Possibility of SLA chargebacks, customer chargebacks, customer refunds. <clears throat> but larger than that, at least in my experience, is what's unquantifiable. And it's what I like to call brand damage, right? Damage to the brand. So customers don't want to use broken products. And in today's world, with the velocity of delivering applications a lot faster, customers have choices, right? They can go somewhere else. So if we suffer an outage, it's not the, the, the old days of retry, retry. You just go to another place and get what you want. You can't get it on Amazon. You go to eBay. So other unquantifiable costs is stock market, right? So we've seen this occur where organizations will suffer an outage and take huge hits in the stock market, right? So damage, not just a brand, but valuation. An example of this was in 2017, British Airways, right? Lost uh, 175 million pounds, 4% uh, of its total valuation in one day, right? And it ended up paying out $150 million in chargebacks to its customers. Uh, another thing you have, right, which I've experienced here is as we move to systems that are more complex, you end up potentially, if you don't have a good practice in place, of chasing fires, right? And it's just from one emergency to another emergency. And if I ask for a show of hands, I'm sure a good amount of folks will put their hands up, right, where you're just constantly chasing a pager. And that, that leads to employee attrition. And then you have a few people left. 
new people come on. They don't want to be a part of that disaster, so they ended up bouncing as well. <clears throat> so we have this little equation we like to use, right? Revenue, employee productivity, chargeback, brand defamation, and employee attrition. So if we do a little bit of our uh, math, if you will, there's 8,760 hours in a year. At three nines of availability, 99.9%, we're talking 8.76 hours of downtime per year. So if we're down for that little amount of time, using the estimate of $300,000 per hour, we're talking $2.63 million. So that's a lot of money that you could use for something else, be it for uh, operational expenses or R&D or bonuses, et cetera. So it's great to move to that. So chaos engineering. What we get from this is inherently failure costs lots of money. Chaos engineering helps to identify weaknesses within your systems. It helps to build more resilient systems, <clears throat> excuse me, more resilient systems, and maybe even avoid some in incidents that you can have by proactively getting ahead of them before they become a problem. It trains you to identify issues and how to respond to them. So it helps drive better operational and support practices within your organization. It allows us to be proactive to responding to these incidents. So who am I? My name is Linda Sweb, right? I live here in beautiful Southern Utah. It is allergy season. It's an amazing place to be. I live in a part of the state where there are one power plant per 2,500 people. Uh, my role here at Gremlin is I'm a chaos account manager. Uh, Previous to where I am here today, I was the lead technical architect for high availability and disaster recovery at the American Express Company, and I drove developer advocacy at Ticketmaster. Uh, interesting fact about me, I love photography. I do a lot of drone photography. I do a lot of uh, little Raspberry Pi-like photography, and I like to make stuff. In, in 2020 pandemic, I learned to weld, I learned to cut metal, and basically it's a constant culture of learning. Now I like questions. So we have a question board here uh, within the interface that you can ask. You can email me directly, right? If you got a question you don't want to put out there or you can hit me up on Twitter. <coughs> Excuse me. How many, how many folks here have heard of Gremlin, right? So Gremlin is not a new name, right? We've been around for a while. It is um, a uh, offering that has provided a consistent experience for rolling out chaos engineering. Now, I, I help work on the professional services side, so this is a passion of mine. Now, you can get started by visiting this URL, right? DevOps21, go to gremlin.com and start your free trial, free usage. So, what is chaos engineering? <coughs> so, Chaos engineering is not new, right? I've been practicing it since 2007, right? I've been working, I did uh, BCRS at IBM. So it's not a new set of um, thinking, but it's becoming broader, right? We've, we've all done this as we grow up, right? As we've been growing up, you'd ask the question, right? Uh, what'll happen if I do X, Y, and Z? What'll happen if I mix vinegar and sodium? What'll happen if I, you know, uh, jump off this ledge? What will happen if I eat this mushroom, right? There's a whole bunch of things that we ask. What if, what if, what if? So this basically shows uh, a ton of companies that are doing this today, right? <clears throat> Jesse Robbins manually, uh, Jesse Robbins does something that I like to do, right? Which is just pull a bunch of plugs out and see what happens, right? Pull out the power cords in the data center. And this is not really acceptable in today's world, but back in the day, it was it's exciting. Um, many enterprise started building disaster recovery teams. I was a part of one of those at Amex uh, in 2010, right? We started building DR and high availability teams. People started doing this on a regular basis. And in 2014, Bruce Wan coins the term chaos engineering at Netflix. So we moved away from reactive disaster recovery to proactive disaster avoidance. Uh, Gremlin was founded in 2016 by Colton Andrus and Matthew Fornick uh to help more companies safely and easily practice chaos engineering. So in that time, in the past five years, we've matured a product and we've built something that I think is special. 
Chaos engineering is a misnomer though, right? It's not like the undesigned experiments we used to do back in the day where we're just pulling plugs, turning stuff off and seeing what happens. It really is simulating chaos of the real world in a controlled environment. And then that, that's something of emphasis, right? It is a experimenting in a controlled way. So carefully applying failures with an explicit hypothesis, right? So this is critically important on the drive that we like to push to use the scientific method. Scientific method is that method that we all learn in primary school. We haven't used it, but we do every day, but we don't realize it. We wanna build that into how we do experiments at your organization. We wanna validate our hypothesis once we set that up. Start with the smallest increment, right? And then grow out the blast radius. So, so what I mean by this here is instead of testing your whole data center, start with a small subset. Start with a small attack and then grow that and grow that, right? Move safely from small scale to larger scale. Move safely from development to staging to production. And that, that journey, as you see, will yield the best results. Right? It'll identify things that you may not have known about the system. Part of my experience is that when we go through these exercises, folks become aware of dependencies that they were not aware of in their testing cycles. In that, when we talk about dependencies within your testing cycles, we, we, we realize that communication becomes strongly important right, within this system. So communicating with key stakeholders, share your plans with your sister teams, your dependent teams, with teams that you're dependent on and run these experiments. If you have, uh, the purpose for this is if you have an issue that cascades, you want people to know why, right? So we don't end up rebooting the whole data center. <laughs> Chaos engineering is all about learning, right? So build that culture of learning, using it, learn new things. If you're not learning anything, doing it, then you're probably doing it wrong. Uh, I like the uh, concept of share internally and externally. So I'm all about building white papers, talking to folks about what I learned, so when we talk about that, we have this chaos engineering community. So there's a chaos engineering Slack that you're able to join, um, which, which we're a part of uh, within the Slack community. Uh, chaos engineering is a well-defined process, right? That requires regular practice. So it's not something you do once. I've, I've interacted with organizations where it became a check item and you just did a few things, see flood CPU, flood network, flood storage, and then you were done, right? And then you didn't do it again until next year. That's the old way of doing the disaster recovery, right, from 10 years back. What we want to do is work through iteration and build that blast radius, build that magnitude. We want to update our hypothesis based on the results of our last tests, and then we want to repeat. Uh, what I like to do in this phase is once I get this stuff rolled up, is I don't want to roll out a new piece of software that breaks what I just fixed. So I do automation, punch some automation in, and we can do regression testing as well. So we don't end up rolling out a feature and cause the same issue that we just resolved. So it helps us present, uh, prevent uh, software regression, right, and features and capabilities. So basically to sum this up, what is chaos engineering? Thoughtful planned experiments designed to reveal weaknesses in our system. Right. So where, where's tech broken right in your stack? Right. Because the technology stack is not just the technology itself, but it's also the people. So. The user experience breaks when we insufficiently test our systems. Do we have validation of auto scaling? Are we using CAS engineering to validate observability and alerting? Is monitoring and alerting working? Are the operational run books in place, et cetera? So all these uh, experiments you can start with, right? I like I like to start with, uh, is my monitoring working, is logging working, is alerting working, and I move it to the next level, right? What What's broken through state of error analysis? What is uh, the principal complaints with my software? And then ultimately we're revealing the weaknesses in our system that everybody else sees. It helps drive the, within the people side, it helps drive uh, the culture of learning it helps reduce folks chasing a pager, right? I remember my IBM days, I lived with a pager. I was working 50, 60 hours a week, 
just answering sev one calls, sev one calls. Uh, Chaos Engineering is designed to help mitigate that. So everybody probably wants to do it, right? It, it goes to like, I want to fix that leaky faucet, but, and everybody has an excuse. So, and we've heard all these excuses, right? We don't have time, right? We don't have time to do this. Daily operations are time suck because reactive firefighting, right? Because we're chasing that pager. So we're doing our RTV everyday work and we're unable to do more. So everyone has the same amount of time, right? In, in an eight hour period, everybody has eight hours. So we have to prioritize this. What is more important than making your business up and available? So as we get through it all, the instance of we don't have time uh, is an excuse that we can overcome through some planning. We don't need to break things. They break on their own, right? So another argument or excuse is we have enough chaos in the data center. Things break on their own. At 3 a.m. when you're sleeping and you just got off another call, your pager goes off and you're back at work. So why not break things on your own schedule instead of letting them break on their own, right? That's how we overcome this excuse. We don't know how to get started. So start simple, right? As you go through uh, the, the beginning of this journey for yourselves and your teams, start small, right? Is the application going to be able to handle 100% CPU, right? Do we, is our failover going to work? How do you deal with uh, memory, right? As more memory gets consumed and there's less uh, free memory for what happens if my simple service restarts and then using those three or four little base areas there, you can start building from there, right? Get that, uh, uh, what, do they, what do I call it? Resiliency IQ in place, right? Your chaos engineering uh, journey begins there. So what simple assumptions can you have within your group that you can validate through chaos engineering? So it's, it's a good uh, uh, starting point for anyone who's starting this journey. So in principle, no more excuses, right? Now, today is the time to start. If you have to go through a complex process to get there, you can probably find something you can do today. And as I just said, now is the best time, right? Systems become more complex over time. So if there's an iteration you're working through and you're working on a PI or uh, some agile method, you're building new features, Simply adding, you know, one hour to that cycle to do a level of chaos engineering, that's the beginning of this journey, right? Start when things are less complex. So you're building software today, put that in, right? Put, put in a, a level of uh, resiliency and chaos engineering. So how do you get started, right? Start small, right? Start small and increase the blast radius. Expand a blast radius. <clears throat> so, so, <clears throat> excuse me. But do it in a controlled environment, right? So, as you move through here, you'll need to have the principal people to work on the system, not just one person running an attack and you don't know what to do and you got to submit a bunch of tickets, but try to get everybody together. Everybody who's got the permissions to go into your dashboard, be it your Dynatrace or Splunk or whatever monitoring tool you have, someone to get into the system itself and log into your Linux or Windows box, and someone to run the attacks. And then expand. Right, so adopt the practice and development so engineers are architecting for failure. So as we go through here, then not only are we going to start small, but we're going to start building that thinking forward so we're not being reactive, but proactive. Get confident in your testing cycles and development. Right? So mature your practice and the things you do in development. And then move to staging. Start small in staging and expand your blast radius. Finally, move into production. Start small and increase. So the biggest reward ultimately will come when you get to production. Because that's going to be where you're running against real traffic where you're going to see the biggest reward, where folks will stop complaining about how their credit card wasn't able to work or how 50,000 fans can't get into an Atlanta Falcons game. And these are both issues that I've dealt with in the past. 
work in it really work iteratively iteratively that's a word that I don't know how to say really well <laughs> uh, iterate on your chaos engineering just like you do on code right so don't work on this long method to deliver something in six months build it into each little release cycle that you have move to uh, move chaos engineering up the environment like you do code so as you promote code, move it with it, move it with it. And it's something we all do well today, right? We promote our code through our pipeline, move that chaos engineering practice with it as it goes forward. <coughs> Without production testing, recovery won't work when called upon. Uh, the truth in this statement is amazing, right? All too often, in my experience, I've seen folks do a level of resiliency testing, performance testing, recovery testing in a non-production environment. So what ends up happening is the idea that no two environments are the same. So when you're moving from staging to dev to QA to prod, just because it worked in dev does not mean it will work in prod. Staging is not production no matter how much you mirror it, right? You're only gonna be able to get production in production. And unless you're testing in production, there's no guarantee that your recovery safe functions will, your recovery safe <coughs> guards will function as anticipated or designed. Testing in production sounds scary at the beginning because that is where our customers live. That's where our reputation lives. That's where our brand lives. But that's also where we remediate and resolve the issues that our customer have. In my last organization, um, our Number one alerting method wasn't Dynatrace, Splunk, Istio. It was Twitter, right? And we would take a pounding in the public space. So we would bring up all these dashboards searching for keywords when we roll out a bunch of tickets for an NFL game or we open up a season or a concert. And when we started seeing those issues show up there, it was real-time alerts, right, from people who were unable to do something. Oh, Ticketmaster can't do this. Ticketmaster can't do that. But that was all in production, so it wouldn't matter if we did it in lower environments. We had to fix it in prod. <coughs> so chaos engineering uh, that we that we come to from Gremlin, we have uh, several big buckets that we like to put stuff in. Resource failures, right? So if you uh, navigate our site, we'll have the resource failure attacks that you can go through, which is CPU, disk, memory, and I.O., Right. So in addition to starting small, these these little tests will help you move along that journey. Right. This is what the cloud is built for. So you can do CPU, disk, memory, I.O., and you can test your auto scaling. Right. Are you able to auto scale out? Right. There's a common misconception that if I got auto scale and I'll be able to respond and scale out on demand as required as we go up. But there's also build time that most folks don't build into their SLAs and their SLOs. So it may take 10 minutes to deploy a new server, right? Running these tests can help you determine what that lead time is and whether or not pre-scaling is something that you should look into the, to mitigate the negative experiences by your customers. Service failures, right? Process killer, host pod container shutdown and sort of time travel, right? How do you skew the clock? So can your service restart itself? So in this set of attacks, the debate comes to, if I turn off a service, did you build the service well enough that it's able to restart on its own without manual intervention, right? And this is a, a thing I'm super passionate about. When we would have services go down in my previous job many years ago, Linux team would have to go log in and restart the service. So we debated up on the resiliency team. Why not just automate it? Is traffic automatically rooted on a restarted service? So this is a uh, uh, another attack that I like, right? In that if we have an A side, a B side, and a C side, and we take that C side out of rotation, will traffic automatically distribute itself among the remaining nodes? Right, and then secondly, what is the uh, uh, time to live for those transactions that were in flight to the C node? So this is testing you can do on your end um, with you know, yeah, gaining a better IQ for your systems. <coughs> so 
So starting with that, you ensure that you're at least your stuff is resilient, right? So that your services can recover on their own, that the continuity of service to your customers is still there. Dependency failure. These will be, um, if I have a backend dependency, be it DNS, right? So if I have a DNS dependency, what happens if I interject and turn off that DNS system is no longer available? Right? What happens if uh, a member node of my SQL database cluster is not available? Right, to my application layer. What happens if we start dealing with a higher level of latency or packet loss? Right, so what happens to my application of dependencies unavailable? Right, that's an area of learning in that you can lay out your data flow and user flows for your application and determine what's critical for the actual business workflow. So an example I like to speak to here is Netflix. When you go out to Netflix, there's a... Uh, a suggested show, right, that comes up on the top bar based on what you recently watched. But if I'm going to go watch the latest season that everybody's watching of whatever show, I don't care if that's there. So the whole system shouldn't stop because that suggestion bar is gone, right, or it's not available. The whole system shouldn't become a negative experience. You just bypass it. So that's what I like to get from dependency failure. What are my critical dependencies and how do I progress and maintain uh, my brand while cutting out non-critical dependencies. <coughs> Excuse me. So infrastructure order, or infrastructure issues uh, are mostly what we just talked about, right? But we get down into application failure, right? Injection of latency into your code, what happens? Injection of errors into your code, what happens? So is that from these three here or these four here on the board, this one is the more advanced one that you can start to uh, build to, that you can start to design for, that you can start putting into your code, right? Are timeouts proper within my application? So I recently had a customer who just put 10 seconds on everything because that was <laughs> that was the biggest, best thing that didn't cause any issues, right? So they never really analyzed where the problems were. They just found a big enough number that everything just seemed to work, but really it wasn't. Uh, so instead of using retries or timeouts, they just built in a really high number that as a customer still made my experience really negative. Continuous chaos, right? So this goes to reinforce the statement I had earlier, which was automate, right? Have confidence in your systems within a specific failure mode, right? So outage, downtime, DNS outage, uh, backend systems not available, non-critical dependency has failed, one of the nodes is down, CPU is spiked on two, of, two out of five of these cluster nodes, et cetera. Right? So if we build these continuously into our pipeline or continuously running these chaos experiments, we can prevent uh, additional failure, right? Drift in configuration, as an example. Uh, we roll out new software, but we're not automatically testing for stuff we already resolved. We're eventually going to drift back into real chaos, right? Real outages and chasing that pager again. <coughs> so does it really work, right? Um, that, that's the question I get all the time being on professional services, right? Does it work? Oh, let's, let's look at backcountry, right? 72-hour SLO breach on Black Friday in 2017. Right? It is a huge, huge, huge thing, right? You, Black Friday is big for any company. 72 hours. So in this case, the database backend started messing up on orders. I'll try to recall this here, messing up on orders. And pretty soon the team had a fix to try to resolve that, but we're unable to verify that fix. So we just ran it out, right? They just ran it out, not we. Um, what ended up happening is it ended up cascading and causing more issues. So Backcountry went and introduced Gremlin, started running that in production, ran a game day, verified the fix, and was able to identify other bugs that were in the, other bugs that were in their system. The result was pickers did not misship orders despite 
uh, the introduction of new latency, right? So they built a more resilient system. Even when systems became latent, the system didn't fall out. Black Friday 2018 went off without incident, right? So all these fixes that were put through from 27, 2018, backcountry is able to maintain its reputation, revenue, brand. Nobody was hollering about it. Everything worked. <coughs> everything, excuse me, everything worked well. MailChimp, right? So MailChimp went out and wanted to verify what services were included in Critical Path. So this goes to the Netflix example I had earlier about suggestions. The Critical Path is a set of services which are required for a customer to have a good spirit experience. So required is the key thing there, right? Not everybody needs your Netflix suggestion, right? In MailChimp, <coughs> MailChimp, oh, excuse me, MailChimp, black hole services they believed were not critical to that experience. And what they found was that these were in the critical path, which would cause the entire web app to not work. So the solution that MailChimp put in was that the service was removed from the critical path of the application working and given more of a status of nice to have, right, from a Moscow perspective to, 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 will, to must have. The result is auxiliary information that's only used to enhance customer experience, right, not dictate it. Just like going back to the example of the suggested uh, shows that you watch, right, that's, that, that, that should not be the precursor to my experience of watching a movie. Microservices architecture, it is important to limit the points of failure to only those that are necessary, right? So chaos engineering helps us do this. We can black hole non-critical services within our uh, architectures, and we can see if they're actually non-critical, if they're not uh, stuck on the life cycle of the application. <laughs> so no matter what your business, Right. No matter what you do, no matter where you are, financial services, retail, uh, software development, consulting, etc. Your customers rely upon having a good experience. Right? As a customer, I do a lot of stuff online. It's not really exciting to me when I can't buy something. I'm a remote worker. When I can't log into work, when I can't have conference meetings, when I can't deliver webinars or training or anything that I enjoy, those things make me upset. And if they make me upset, it's probably really easy to think that they make other people upset. So you may recognize some of these names here, right? Each of these have found value in proactively testing for failure, right? Expedia, MailChimp, DreamWorks, Moneyline, Under Armour, Twilio. <clears throat> it's been my pleasure to uh, speak with you all today. Uh, we do have some questions, but thank you so much for your time. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, we've gotten some great questions in so far. Plenty of time for question and answer period though. So if you do have a question for Lindison, please go ahead and use your uh, interface. You can either put it in the Q&A area <laughs> or you can put it in chat and uh, we'll go ahead and move it over for you. All right, here is first question. This one is from Stefan. Uh, Jay, sir, um, uh, let's see. How is chaos engineering normally used? More like a certain time frame regular, regular, regularly, like a pen test, or is it an ongoing practice? So at the end of it all, you want to get to having a regular practice, right? a center of enablement, a, a center of excellence, or some center of these practices that help drive this within the organization. Uh, from what I drive at ProService, building those for your teams, right, to help you uh, navigate that journey and come out with a uh, with a practice that's sustainable, that's growable, and that evolves with your organization. Um, if we approach it in the instance of like pen testing, we can get stuck in a position where we turn it into a check item, and then we don't we 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 don't move forward, and we can regress on the findings that we have. Um, in fact. One of my uh, uh, recent experiments is exactly this, right? What you're describing here is it was being treated like pen testing. Uh, the results that came out of it weren't great. So we moved over to a larger scale uh, rollout for a center of enablement. All right. All right. Uh, <coughs> next question here. Uh, 
Uh, this, and I'm sure this is one that you get a lot. Mark asks, do you really want to risk bringing down the production environment with a production test? Uh, yes, right? So absolutely. And I say that not lightly, right? <laughs> there is yeah. a lot of pre-work that goes into this, but the only way to confirm that it works is to eventually get to production. Right. And that prod test is a small blast radius test that you're growing into. But you have to ensure that the way you build software, the knowledge of your data flow and user flows are well known and understood before you get to that level. Um, certainly do not suggest going into production and just turning off a bunch of stuff for the sake of turning it off. Um, within my previous areas of employ. Um, we've eventually always had to go into production to do testing. And things that we couldn't find uh, in the lower environments would always manifest themselves in prod. So eventually we found that moving up a sort of a progress to get to production yielded the best experience for our fans. Uh, but generally, I'd say nine out of 10, absolutely. There may be those uh, nuanced edge cases where you don't want to run in production. <laughs> Okay. All right. Great. All right. As I said before, there's plenty of time for questions. So go ahead and get your question on it. If you got one for Lindison, uh, here's another one for you. Um, how disruptive should chaos engineering normally be in production? So Stefan, uh, <laughs> ideally it shouldn't be right. We should know our systems well enough that, that, that it's not, but, but it is disruptive. So an approach that I like to have is, when you roll out your production side, don't cut over all the traffic to that side yet, right? So if you have an A and B side or A and B application where A is your primary application, you can roll out the B side and trickle some of that production traffic into it and get real-time stats and feedback on how that's working. Um, with, let's say, a company like Netflix, that's easy enough to do, right? You can just go hit up your buddies and say, hey, you know, I'm going to take your account and I'm going to put you on this new prod thing. I want to see how it works. Uh, but generally, I don't know that flipping the switch to the secondary side that just came out is the best thing to do. But if you can mm -hmm. roll over some testing and small increments it over to increase volume, get the statistics you need to, and then roll back if you have to, that's probably the safest way to do it in prod. All right. Great. Um, okay. This is another good one for you. Uh, Doug asks, because uh, I'm very old. I remember the days when we had pre-prod, which was a replica, perhaps scaled down with all the same interfaces as production. Does this qualify as the production testing you suggest is essential? So um, I, I go with no in that a previous company that I was at, we spent $100 million on what we call the production mirror. Mm -hmm. And even in production mirror, we were unable to bring all the dependencies into that system into systems that matter. So even if you had that replica, if you were downsized, um, a lot of folks make this mistake, I think. It's when you have that, you're downsized and you're, let's say, one to four, you take those results that you had and you say, well, I can handle four times the traffic right, mm -hmm. in production. And what ends up happening is the software was not designed to handle four times the traffic because you went to build it for that, that uh, lower environment. Um, so my experience has said that the production mirror or production replica usually ye yields bad assumptions as we roll them to prod mm -hmm. and unable to get the good results we have. And I think that's on a smaller uh, on a smaller scale of having huge issues. You probably can get away where six out of 10 or seven out of 10 things that you do won't manifest themselves in a higher environment like production. But other things uh, will manifest themselves, especially if you have a lot of legacy backend systems like a mainframe or... Um, you have those A400s, et cetera, running in the back end that you're unwilling to spend more money on to create mirrors for. That's where you'll start seeing a lot of deltas, I think, on the results of running between a replica and prod. All right, great. I uh, got another question here from Stefan. Uh, he's asking a lot of questions today, which is awesome. Is there a tool set to, si to simulate the dependency failure just in the small blast radius you want to test in? So we have the black hole attack with an hour uh, portfolio. And this will allow you to, to, to literally state which dependency you just want to take out of rotation. So if you have a backend 
MySQL database, Maria database, something else that you just want to see what happens uh, within the interface. You go in the interface and just say, I want to black hole this traffic from this node that we're going to attack to the dependency we have. And you can do that across many uh, systems. You can build a scenario mm -hmm. that will allow you to stack a lot of these things in parallel. Um, but, yeah, you can start very small point-to-point -point connection uh, all the way down to the port level. All right. Excellent. We've gotten some great questions in so far. Thank you to everybody who has submitted questions, but there's uh, still time. If you do have a question, go ahead and use that question and answer tab or the chat tab and get them on in. And we'll just keep blowing through them here. Uh, here's the next question from uh, Sri Kumar, who, who asks, how do you prioritize as a business between different failures and pick up just one? Clearly, all of them have some form of in business implication. So it's difficult to know which one to chaos engineer first. So how I approach this, Sri, is um, I would like to start with uh, doing an error analysis of my system. Right, so what are the principal errors that are experienced by this system and its dependencies? The second piece I'd like to run through is um, getting a feel for my end-to-end -end architecture, if you will. Right, what, what, where am I deployed? What am I running on? What's the load balancing rules that are set between these things, et cetera? Uh, then I like to build a data flow diagram right, uh, across this uh, specific business process. And I, I like to start at the business process, right, to, to, to answer your first question there. Of, that are most critical to the company and then start from there and work backwards, but not start from the technology and work up, but start from the business side and work down. So once we do the errors on that business process, we can start to annotate the, the impacted architectures underneath this. We build a data flow diagram and overlay it on top of that technology and then do the uh, user analysis of user rate. What is, if you have any SLOs in there, that's a great thing to start measuring inside here. And then prioritize that work based on where you're going to get either what your objective is going to be. Do I want to start moving forward and not take out a whole bunch of stuff and make a bunch of people upset, e.g. start small? Or do I want to mm -hmm. go in there and make an argument for replacing a whole technology stack? Uh, but I think the critical thing there is business process to the errors that you're having, to the data flow, to the technology, and then you can target those systems um, that are most impacted into that business process. Uh, as far as prioritizing it, there's there's three measurements I like to use, right? Impact to my uh, revenue, e.g. Uh, to my customers, impact to my brand, and impact to the people doing the work within the company. Uh, put those things on a one to five scale. The one that comes out the highest is the one that goes first. All right. Great. Next question here. Lahiru <coughs> asks, uh, how do you test for single point of failure in a cloud native application? And how do I how do I identify the approach and main steps? So the SPOF side in cloud, I think uh, let's make some assumptions here. Um, we're going to be running on, well, I guess, are you running on IaaS, PaaS, or SaaS, right? So on the SaaS stuff, that's going to be the SaaS operator's problem. On the PaaS side, uh, defining the, or finding those SPOFs, you can start with a latency attack or black hole attacks and just move down a list and it'll tell you where that SPOF exists. You can also, uh, you're always going to have, I think, in my opinion, at least, you're always going to have a single point of failure, right? You're always going to have a point of contention. You're always going to have a um, that 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 piece where everything gets aggregated, right? It's just going to move up one level. So it used to be CPUs. We scaled out. Then it became nodes. It became platforms. It became server. Then it became <laughs> data center. Eventually, it's going to become a globe, right? We'll start putting stuff on Mars probably, but we'll still have a, a single point of failure. Um, so I would start small and just horizontally move out uh, to start identifying what those SPOFs are. But take note that you'll probably always have an SPOF somewhere in your design, uh, be it all the way up to the business process. All right. Great. Uh, okay, so we are almost, uh, we're about 10 minutes and uh, 11 minutes to the top of the hour. So I think we have time for a couple more questions at least. So we'll just keep right on going. Uh, Shri Kumar has another question. We work with blockchains in our setup and looks like chaos engineering can help us a lot in identifying pain points. Does the product in your portfolio address this need? If not, do you have any recommendations on how we can go about doing this? Uh, my suggestion here, Sri, would be to reach out 
um, shoot over an email and maybe this is a, a deeper conversation on what your system looked like and maybe an opportunity for some sort of POC in that space, right? Um, but without knowing many of the details, I don't know that I can answer that question specifically, right? But blockchain is a super exciting space that I've always been intrigued by. All right, great. Uh, next question, Tan asks, on storage workload testing, what is the difference between object storage like S3 or file storage <laughs> stress test? Uh, I think the largest piece there is going to be, uh, we're talking block versus object, right? Mm -hmm. So on one of those, we're going to be dealing with IOPS for the block, right? So we can address that in what we're going to be writing concurrently or random, what our block size is going to be, and we can sort of uh, mess with that design. I, as I recall, Gremlin comes with only one specific set that comes out for running those tests. On the object side, we're going to be creating objects, right? Uh, so if you're sitting in a, a NVMe or Nearline or Flash Array, those are going to be different. So stress testing on that side, one's create a whole bunch of objects. On the other side, we're going to create a whole bunch of blocks. So those blocks can be uh, 4K uh, size at, you know, with 300 workers or whatever to build those. So I think there's a little bit of a delta there, right, which you're kind of describing in a sense. Um, mm -hmm. My product on the disk side will create I.O., so you should be able to use it both on block and object. Um, but you're going to get different results because of what we're creating. Um, however, I'd like to have a deeper, sort of a deeper conversation on that piece about what you're trying to achieve. And if it's to benchmark just storage, I don't know that Gremlin is the right tool to do that. If it's to benchmark or see what storage IO and stress does to an application, I think Gremlin is the right tool to do that. All right, great. <laughs> Let's see, uh, next question, oh, here's a good one. How do you recommend we share the results of chaos engineering internally? <clears throat> so I, uh, within the Gremlin application, first there's a little area where you can write uh, your observation through. And Gremlin like to call this describe. So describe, it always reminds me of some wizard right, writing stuff in a book, right? So all of history <laughs> can know. So you kind of describe, right? Like the, the, the historian for that project. And you capture, uh, uh, you have a little chart, I like to call it, right? You have a kind of a Cartesian plane uh, on a spreadsheet that says, mm -hmm. here's what we did, here's what we expected, here's what happened. And I put those things in a publicly viewable space within many of my customers, uh, publicly viewable being to my employees, not to the general public. But many of my customers set these up in their, their uh, document repos, Confluence, et cetera, uh, so other people can come through and see what was tested and what those results were. And it helps build that culture of learning and culture of adoption. Um, mm -hmm. You can also do uh, the town hall thing, right? Here's a, a little quick demonstration, right? You do a 10-minute thing. Here's what we did this past week. Here's what happened. Here's what the results were. And here's the work that we're going to do. And I think the most meaningful way to communicate <laughs> is not only what we did, but what we're gonna do because of it. So we're gonna build this feature to have better timeouts, we're gonna define better SLOs, et cetera. Um, that would be my two cents on, on going that direction. But definitely reach out if you got more questions. Yeah. All right, great. Uh, okay, Sri, Sri Kumar has one more question for you. Any recommendations on resources or books or, or blogs on this, please? Very keen to broaden my own understanding of this. As the head of engineering, I want to make sure I know enough about this and get my CTO or CEO on this conversation as well. I would recommend the Gremlin uh, blogs on the blogs on the Gremlin site for sure. But uh, any any other suggestions you have? For, for sure, um, Shri, uh, the Gremlin blogs are a great place to go. There's the Google SRE books. I think it's uh, google.com slash SRE slash books, if I remember. Um, but if you email myself or us, I can get you in touch with someone who will give you a whole sort of welcome package that you can work through. So it's got blogs, it's got things you can read, it's got reports and white papers built into it. And certainly uh, they're, they would be super excited to share that with you. All right, great. So we're about six minutes to the top of the hour. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, Stefan has uh, another question for you. Is it possible to throttle network or storage traffic down until the environment starts misbehaving to find the minimum capacity 
that is needed to or normally operate? <clears throat> so I, that's a great question, right? And I didn't cover this uh, in depth, but we can do status checks within the system. Uh, you can do automatic halt of attacks. You can roll back, but you can throttle that to find out. You, you can basically continue to bring that down to find out if you're able to operate at, I don't know, let's call it 100 megabits, right? Just for sake of simplicity. And you're paying for 10 gigabits, right? Can I operate at 100 megabits? Uh, you, you can do this, right? You can increase latency on there to find out what those higher thresholds are. Um, and you can design to build within those, right? I, I That's not a use case I see often, but I certainly am a proponent to say that the system can provide you the facilities to do what you're describing, Stefan. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Well, we've got five minutes left. I'm going to go ahead and close out the question and answer period um, because uh, I think we've gotten through all the questions, but I also want to give Lindison a little <laughs> bit of a break because obviously he's not feeling a hundred percent. So I do uh, want to uh, thank everybody who did submit questions. There were really, really great ones. And I also want to thank Lindison for hanging in there and answering all those questions. So thank you. <laughs> thanks very much. I uh, also want to quickly remind the audience that today's event has been <laughs> Reported. So if you missed any or all of it, or if you just want to watch it again, you will have the opportunity. Following the webinar today, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the devops.com website. So you can always go look for it there. Just go to devops.com slash webinars and look in the on demand section. It should be right there waiting for you. Uh, Lyndon, Lindison, thank you uh, again for, uh, for hanging in there, like I said, but, uh, but more importantly, Thank you so much for a great presentation. Lots and lots of information imparted in this webinar. And I kind of feel like we could have done 90 minutes, but then again, I you know, wouldn't want to kill you <laughs> doing that. So uh, thank, thank you very much, I appreciate it. And um, also I want to thank the audience for joining me today. But before we uh, close things out, I do want to do the webinar, or sorry, the drawing for the $425 Amazon gift cards in case you thought I forgot. Okay, without further ado, let's go ahead and do that. Our first winner today uh, for the $425 Amazon gift cards is Wendy Q. Congratulations, Wendy. Our second winner today is Martin S. Congratulations, Martin. Our third winner today is Samuel R. Congratulations, Samuel. And our fourth winner today is Ken P. Congratulations, Ken. We'll be following up with all four of you uh, to get your Amazon gift card over to you. So please check your inbox. And if you don't see anything there, please check your spam folder. All right, that's it. I'm going to go ahead and uh, once again, thank the audience for joining me. And once again, thank El Lindison for a great presentation. And this is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I am signing off. Have a great day, everybody, and please stay safe.